How are you? Fine, thank you. Um, today, you, as you know, you are here, I'm sorry about the room confusion, but you are here to join us for the community forum on uh, services for seniors with disabilities living in Lexington. What are the resources and what are the options? Um, it's actually the spring forum. Spring started yesterday. I'm sorry about the rain and the cold weather. I did wear flowers to sort of encourage the spring feeling. Um, but we welcome you today and we have a panel of four speakers. We have Leslie, could you stand up while I introduce you? This is Leslie May Shabani. She's the Assistant Director of Minuteman Senior Services. Thank you. And Melissa, Melissa Interis. And some of you may know her already. Are you still the Assistant Director of Senior Services? Mm -hmm. Director. And Director and no, Director of Human Human Services. Services. Yes. At, at, so they've, they're collapsed into one. I have you listed two separate No, I, I, I. You went I one to yes. yes. OK. So, so. <laughs> From the really, time I'm that like I first asked Melissa right to do this to the time that to, to today, she's been promoted to Director of um, Human Direct Services here at the, for the town of Lexington, and I do think some of you know her already. Susan Barrett, who is the transportation uh, manager for the town of Lexington, and is Gail Bartlett here yet? Gail Bartlett, she's not here quite yet, but she is a representative from uh, Department of Developmental Services, Central Middlesex area, the service coordinator, supervisor, and she will be talking to you about um, using funds from DDS for self-direction. Okay, thank you thank all you. so much. So as we get started, um, I do want to remind you there's food at the back. I think you've all seen it. Feel free to take some at the end. At the end, we're going to have some questions. Um, there are name tags. There's also a sign-up sheet. If you'd like to have information from today sent to you, we do need your email address on the sign-up sheet. Um, I have a couple of announcements. Let me see. Is Michael Levitt here? Michael Levitt? Michael Levitt sent me an email the other day. And I just, I'll read this now and I'll remind you at the end, but he's from the Lexington Lions Club and he just wants me to remind you that the Lexington Lions Club has wheelchairs, walkers, canes, and other items available to residents. You just need to email him or go on their website. So I have that information if that's of interest to anyone. Um, some of you joined, excuse me, some of you joined us for our fall forum and I just want to say that this forum is held and hosted by the Ark of Massachusetts in conjunction with the Dana Home Foundation. So for those of you who live in Lexington, you probably know that the Dana Home was a home for senior citizens in Lexington throughout the 1900s. Um, but then when it became, toward the end of the 1900s, the 2000s, when it became possible for senior citizens to age in place, to age in their homes with support services, there was no longer a need for a live-in residential Dana Home Foundation. So the building was sold, and the money was put into a foundation, and the foundation now supports, every year, it supports a number of, uh, they receive grants, and they give out a number of awards, and the awards focus on the same service. They make sure that they are helping senior citizens age with dignity in their community and in their homes. And so we at the Ark of Massachusetts were very fortunate to receive one of those grants. This is our second year in a row. And what we've done, we've partnered with the Dana Home Project to bring services to adults with disabilities living in the town of Lexington. And when I say adults, uh, when I say seniors with disabilities, we really stretch the definition. We, we started around 50 years old and up. And so, and then this year we dropped the age a little bit to 45. And so we have a number of folks who are working specifically with families who have adult children age 45 and older who have a disability. Um, just helping them get connected to the community, maybe future plan, come up with ideas about that. And so we have in the back row, there's a back row here, and if you want to just turn around, we have the Ark of Massachusetts has what we call support, support brokers. And these women help you navigate um, services which, as you know, it can be very difficult. So, let's see, across the back we have Carrie Mahoney, raise your hand, and, and Kathy Kelly, and Barbara Pandolfi, and Christine Shane, and Evelyn is um, support broker emeritus. You probably all know her through Lexington. Is Kim here yet? Am I missing anybody? But if you have questions afterwards, 
specific questions, they would be good people to talk to. Um, but they're in the background. So I think, and also over here we have Julie Manugian, um, and she, you might recognize her as well. She's from Lex Media, and she's filming this today. We had some requests that this be filmed and put on Lex Media, so it will be available. Julie, do you know when it will be available? Yes, it'll be on the Lex Media website next week. Perfect, perfect. So if you have friends who wanted to come today and couldn't make it, please, please feel free to share that information with them. And I could also send you the link so that you could share it with everybody okay. here. Yeah, so make sure if you'd like the link shared with us through the Ark of Massachusetts, make sure that your email is on the sign-up sheet in the back, okay? Um, I'm trying to think if there are any other questions. Uh, anything before we begin? I'm going to turn this off, yes. Okay. <laughs> Will it turn off if I just do this? No. This. There we go. Uh -huh. All right. Oh, and the picture, I don't know if you noticed it when you came in. Um, the, there was a picture. That was my son. My son is 28 years old. He has Down syndrome. Um, he lives at home. But the picture, and I just that's one of my favorite pictures. He's standing in front of the Supreme Court because that, to me, the connection is very real. Um, and yesterday was World Down Syndrome Day, so I just thought... I would take advantage of the day and put his picture okay. up here as we got started. But now here's Leslie Mae Shabani. Do you say Chuck or Sh Chef? Chef. Shabani. <laughs> from <laughs> this is Okay. Can you all hear up here, by the way? Everything's yep. fine in the back? Okay, okay, great. All right, well, thank you all so much for um, having me today. Uh, I am with Minuteman Senior Services, uh, and we are one of the 26 aging service access points across the state. Uh, and our network of services has been around for about 40 plus years and it was really a grassroots effort um, from just regular folks in the community wanting a different uh, path rather than struggling at home or going into a nursing home. And so the folks in Massachusetts, we have a long tradition of, you know, starting new governments. Uh, so that's what they did. They put an effort forward saying that we wanted something that was more structured. So our uh, services are administered under the Executive Office of Elder Affairs at the state uh, level. And so they determine all of our eligibility criteria for programs uh, and then we uh, then carry out the programs within that um, scope of service and, and, and in those, um, with those regulations. And we are um, reviewed every uh, three to four years for a designation review to make sure that we are doing a good job and that the state then says yes we will renew your designation. Uh, and we just went through that, I think, last year. So there's about 20 plus programs. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of them by any means. Uh, but we cover a specific geography. Every uh, aging service access point in the state has their own towns. So we have the same core services. We just cover different towns. Lexington is one of our towns. Uh, and we cover towns from like Harvard and Stowe all the way through to like... Um, uh, Burlington and Winchester, Arlington, this whole kind of, I look at it like the, the um, apple picking <laughs> sounds a little further on either side. Uh, but um, we serve uh, in our state home care program, which is, well first let me just ask, how many people have heard of Minuteman Senior Services? So, yeah, I don't have to say the whole thing. Then. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, most of you may know us from like our Meals on Wheels programs, the Shine program, our state home care program. Uh, and again, most of those are state. We do have some federal programs, and then we do have some private pay programs as well. Uh, but today, I'm really going to focus on the caregiver supports. And caregiving uh, is very dear to my heart. Uh, I have been in the network for um, probably going on 14 years, maybe, 14, 15 years. And I think the absolute, my favorite job was absolutely being a caregiver specialist. I just felt like it was such a privilege to have people, you know, open up their homes and open up their hearts to you in such vulnerable moments. Uh, and really to be able to help understand what's going on for them and create an action plan so that they can perform that caregiving task, those tasks, in a healthy way. And I feel that um, caregivers really do support the entire family. And a lot of times their focus is on other people, not on themselves. 
And so if we can help support the caregiver, we help support the entire family. Because you have so many folks who are caring for a spouse. Sometimes it's caring the spouse, or the, the parent is caring for the aging uh, child. Sometimes it's the um, child, the aging adult child, caring for the parent or a sibling. Um, then you have grandparents who are caring for their grandchildren and I think a lot of times with the opioid crisis we're certainly seeing more of that. Um, so there's just a lot of different relationships that we're trying to support but we really are trying to have a more uh, whole view of the family and how we can support the entire family. So one of the programs we have is a federal program and it's called the Family Caregiver Support Program. It is not income based it just means you are caregiving, and it can be in a very broad sense. It can be, um, we've helped daughters, sons, say out in California, whose maybe parent lives in one of our towns. And so it's very hard, you know, to be helping someone, your parent, you're trying your best, but you have work, you have your own family out there, and you're trying to support someone out here. So the caregiver specialist will talk to you on the phone in that case. Uh, if they come to visit, a lot of times the caregiver specialist will make it a, 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 a time to meet with them in the home uh, and really start understanding how they can best create a plan uh, to really look at not only the, the person they're caring for, but also the caregiver's needs. Because a lot of times you need regular respite. Um, Sometimes you'll need more information on a specific illness or disease. Maybe it's that you need some help with the financial planning and we can get your resources to elder law attorneys to help with that so that you can try to figure out how best to use the resources you have. Uh, a lot of times it's do we add on to our home? Do we now go into assisted living? What, are, what can we do? Uh, and then sometimes it's really about um, how do I do this while I'm also caring for my children, while I'm also working. Or in a situation where maybe the caregiver needs to think about succession planning. If it's the parent caring for the older child, <coughs> the adult child, and they need, they're feeling like, you know what, for emergency planning, I need to think about who's going to be caring for them if I'm not here. And I think that's one of the things that we always try to talk about with anyone who's in that caregiver role. What happens if you're not there, right? What happens? And so we try to really work at who's in your circle, how can we increase those supports, how can we get you connected to professionals. Uh, and I just want you to think about looking at Minuteman as one of those potential partners for you. Uh, this is something that we do every day and we will certainly work with folks in crisis and that happens all the time. But really our big push is to try to help people think about these things before there's a crisis. Um, it's just easier on you, right? If you're in the hospital or you are in the waiting room for somebody in the hospital, there's so much going on um, emotionally. Uh, you're worried about that. You're trying to understand medically what's happening. And then you also have to then figure out what are the services I'm knowledgeable for? How am I going to do this? How do I take off work? How do I make all this happen? Um, you can do that. People do it. We work with you. But it's just easier if you already know what services exist if you have made some connections to professionals and you don't have to do all that legwork up front at the same time. So we really encourage you to come to, um, we have an agency overview about every, every uh, couple of months. Um, you're welcome to come to that. You're also welcome to just call the information referral line. We have an information referral line that's federally funded and uh, it is free. They will ask targeted questions that are very good at kind of listening to your story uh, and then trying to match you with the best program. So if you're just trying to understand what services are available, that's a good place to go.
Was it? Yes. Could I just ask you a question? When you say come to us, we have regular mm -hmm. meetings. Could you mm -hmm. say, say where, or did you already at say? Minute Man Senior Serve, which at, is at located 26 uh, Crosby Drive in Bedford. Thank you. Uh, and so uh, we have that in our email blast. So if you would want to know when those are, you can. Those are always noted in the email blast. So if you give us your email, we'll be happy to add you to the list. Uh, so it doesn't give you just that, but it gives you all kinds of other information too. So the um, again, the caregiver program, it's short term, right? They're not going to be care managers or like the service brokers where they will follow you long term, but they will give you a very um, focused attention in those vulnerable moments. And they can come in and talk to you a couple times, but it's meant to be a short term intervention. So any questions about that particular, or before I go on to the next one, I don't want to confuse everyone as I talk about it. Yes, ma'am. So is there, um, do you, did you happen to bring anything with you that would provide information about, if we didn't want to sign up for another email list? Sure. Did you? We have brochures, absolutely, just about Minuteman. If you go onto our website, we have all the information about our caregiver supports right on the website. So it's minutemanseniororg Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, I apologize for having this to be It's okay. Um, I have a question for you. Um, if, uh, well, our home is probably very soon going to be renovated sure. completely for me with my limitations. What I'm wondering, does Minivan provide, to, to age in place there, does Minivan provide services mm -hmm. um, that will be the equivalent of, say, assisted living? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm aging in place, but I need all of these services. Mm -hmm. Do you approximate them? So what the state, so again, I'll just back up a little bit. Um, we are under the Executive Office of Elder Affairs. They set the criteria, the eligibility criteria for all our programs, and then we administer them um, under their guidance, under their regulations. So under the state home care program, there are three criteria for eligibility. It's age, kind of functioning levels, and then your income. So if you are eligible for that, then you will receive a care manager at Minuteman who will coordinate services, sort of like this service broker, right? We must, by law, we cannot have direct service. So the state wants a wall there so that you have a conflict-free assessment of need. So that we can't say, oh, we're going to pad this and say you need all this because now we're going to pay our homemaker to go out and do all that, right? So they want a wall there. So we subcontract out all of the direct in-home care to a provider network. And we have about 70 different providers. They have criteria that, again, the state sets and they have to meet and we will contract with them. So if you're eligible for certain programs, yes, you can have a homemaker in your home who will help you with the laundry and the cleaning, um, meal preparation, uh, grocery shopping. Um, it can be med medication reminders. Um, it can be all of the bathing assistance, you know, things like that. Um, so it really can provide a lot of support, but again, depending on what program you're eligible for, there's different levels of care. Um, and that is, that is exactly why folks in the community, they wanted that option rather than just going to a nursing home or struggling at home, you know, on your own. And I think really with the family shift, uh, we have such a demographic shift where it used to be, you know, everybody lived in the same town. You had your aunts, your uncles, your grandparents, your nieces, your nephews, everybody around. So you had sort of this enormous network of support, informal support. And some people still have that, but most people don't, right? Families are spread out all over the country and even all over the world. So it's really about thinking about how can we help support each other in different ways. Even with like healthcare proxies, you know, that might be something that a neighbor doesn't think about, but that really may be exactly what that person may need because they don't have anyone. We've had a number of situations like that. So we just have to kind of think about this differently and how we can help support each other in the community. 
Um, so yes, there is potential for there. You just have to just kind of know what program you're eligible for, and that's why I think calling um, the information referral specialist, they will walk you through it and they will help you with understanding what you would be eligible for and what you wouldn't be. Yeah, that was exactly it. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have time now to do things to help other people. My husband, Fabulous. I used to do a lot for him, but he's not alive any longer, so Sorry. I have time. And I thought I would try to do Meals on Wheels. We would love to have you uh, as a well, volunteer. Well, I to sign up for it, and I haven't heard a thing. Okay, well, if you give me your information, I can talk to our HR director. She's the one who starts the process with our volunteers, and I can try to find out where it is. Oh, but we right. absolutely <coughs> we can't we can't run that program without volunteers. Believe Besides me. Besides that, is there other things that people can start? Absolutely, to do? we have our Shine program. That's a volunteer-based program, and I mean the dedication that people have shown. They go through about 50 hours of training to understand the Medicare benefit. It's mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Um, our money manager volunteers, they help folks in the home who maybe need help organizing and paying bills every month. But it really helps stabilize your situation if you have, you know, making sure that all your utilities, your rent, your mortgage, whatever is paid. Um, it's an enormous support. And they can also help even with a budget. So that could be something as well. And then we have an urgent need for our ombudsman program. We run an ombudsman program under the state so that you have a um, advocate in the nursing home. We do not, it's all volunteers, and they will go to the nursing home and make visits weekly and check in with residents to see if there's any issues. And then they will bring <coughs> that to the administration of the nursing home to try to work that out. But that program is in absolute great need for that as well. Um, Kristen Malone is the program manager for that. So yes, I'm happy to talk with you afterwards about mm -hmm. that, but we would absolutely love to have you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, I'm Shai Kanzler. I, oh, have a yes. Yes. I have a client come to talk to me. Mm -hmm. She needs home care. Yes. Okay, she's a senior mm -hmm. and she's low income. Mm -hmm. Okay. The problem, I told her, you know, if she needs home care, she needs to go to mini -mended. Yes. But she told me she did. Okay. But the excess point, someone come to see her, ask her okay. to raise her hand, she can, her problem, she can raise her hand, but okay. her finger, she cannot comb her hair, she okay. cannot wash, and they deny. And she comes so to see me. She there's, says, yeah, like I said, the state has certain criteria, but I'm happy to talk about her situation, her particular situation with you separately to see what we can do. Okay. But there, the state sets the criteria, so if she's not eligible for that, you know, we, they, she can always appeal. There's always a right to appeal a decision. Um, but the intake care manager and the supervisor do look at those to see if they meet that okay. criteria. Yes. So I, can you all hear me? So last year, I mentioned that we support um, adults with disabilities in the town of Lexington. And last year, Leslie was very helpful helping to set something up for one of our, um, one of the young men that we, well, one of the men we were working with. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, so what I was um, sharing, I think, with Carrie earlier is that um, there, I've been kind of learning a lot more about the, uh, developmental and intellectual uh, de uh, disability uh, community. And one of the things when I went out to kind of visit um, with different folks was understanding that there's a real need to, and a desire, to create um, opportunities for um, gaining employment. And so one of the things that um, we've done with our supportive housing uh, building in uh, Drake Village is to have one of the gentlemen uh, be, gain some volunteer experience as a companion. We have a care manager there at the at the um, Drake Village, and so he's really been doing a great job of supporting all types of different activities with our with the um, folks who live in the um, Drake Village Housing Authority building and gaining some experience. And my hope is that you know then he can be applying for a work. Um, you know, an employment position at one of the home care agencies. So we're kind of starting to see how we can maybe create a more formal situation um, and really start kind of working on those types of things. Um, and that's, I think, one of the efforts that I really see is that 
we want to encourage you to not only think of the um, services in the uh, you know through DDS and the ARCs that I think a lot of you know a lot about and are very familiar with, um, but in your situations as you're aging, uh, there are services that you can connect with to increase um, your supports through Minuteman Senior Services. So the caregiving program is one, the healthy living program is another one. We have um, healthy living evidence-based classes for caregivers to support a healthy living, I mean a healthy caregiving frame, uh, as also with your own um, illnesses that you might be um, having to deal with. There's chronic disease self-management classes uh, that um, really allow you to, to really start focusing on what kind of behavioral changes, lifestyle changes you need to make. And Lexington, we're doing a uh, collaboration with um, Lexington Community Center to have the Powerful Tools for Caregiver class here. Uh, and that's been kind of a joint effort to really provide those communication tools, boundary setting tools for family caregivers. Mm -hmm so that they're providing this care without depleting themselves. So there's a lot happening, and I hope that you will just uh, look on our website or give us a call. Yes, Carrie. Um, I just had a question about that. Healthy living, is mm -hmm. that available to just people who Everybody. aren't? 18 are plus. Okay. 18 plus. So that would be nice for individuals themselves Absolutely. who have disabilities and Absolutely. are kind of living in different situations. Absolutely. Great. Great. Thanks. All right. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Leslie. For the magic to happen here. Um, that's coming on. It's warming up. Oh, it's warming yeah, it's up. Bit, okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah, it's a By the way, one other announcement that I meant to say in the beginning, just housekeeping. We ha there'll be a bag at the back for recycling, so if you have water bottles or coffee cups at the end that you want to send for recycling, I'll just have this bag back there and I'll make sure that they get recycled, okay? This bag. Today. Um, so I'm going to talk about the transportation services that currently exist within our community. It's definitely focused on Lexington, um, but if you come or you serve people in other areas, maybe some of what I'm sharing can hopefully be of use to you in that way as well. Uh, let's see here. Uh, ah, good. Okay. I thought what I'd talk about is kind of two main buckets, fixed route services and then other. <laughs> So the other, I had initially named door-to-door, -door, and then I realized, well, they're not all door-to-door. -door. Some of them are more curb-to-curb. -curb. Some are door-to-door, -door, and some might get you through the door. So I'll talk about that as we move on. And one of the things that I want to mention, too, and you may already know this, the town is working on its comprehensive plan. Are you all familiar with that? And that is truly comprehensive. The town is looking at updating its plan. Um, it's accounting for housing, it's accounting for transportation, economic development, and more. Um, so that's ongoing. We've had a transit study, which is still ongoing, which you may have heard about. And also we have the age-friendly 
planning that um, Melissa is leading um, with Hamali Shah. All of that will kind of work in concert with each other. We hope that for all those efforts to be coordinated. And I'm mentioning this just because this is what we have now. Maybe in the future, maybe we'll have some different services. So, but this is what we have now, what I'm going to talk about. Okay. So I mentioned, you know, my first bucket that I want to talk about is the fixed route services. And by the way, I'm mentioning a range of services. Some might not work for you, but they might work for other people. And some of them, maybe all of these might work for you in some situations, but not in all. So bear with me if I'm not touching on uh, getting to the ones you're most interested in right away. So um, hopefully you're all familiar with the MBTA. It's a rather large system, serves 175 um, towns and cities in the Commonwealth through a combination of buses, subway, commuter rail, ferries. Um, and what we have that comes right through town are two buses, the Route 62 and the Route 76, right? They both um, generate from Alewife, 62 goes out to the VA in Bedford, the 76 goes from Alewife to um, MIT, Lincoln Lab, and also to Hanscom Civil Air Force Base and back, you know, and all the places in between. They operate Monday through Friday is two separate routes, and on Saturday, they're one joint route with a slightly different service, and unfortunately, um, no MBTA service on Sunday. The MBTA has um, really tried to um, increase its accessibility for people of various mobility levels, So, and they keep trying to make further improvements. And I have this little handy book here about what they try to do with each um, type of service that they provide. And if you go on your web, their website, you can even see that broken out by type of service, whether it's the bus, the subway, and so forth. And if you want to know what the accessibility features are, um, you can view those there. Um, they have something also called the Riders Transportation Access Group. We also have a couple flyers downstairs as well. So this is an advocacy group. So if you're interested in making the T more accessible, this is for seniors and people with disabilities of any age, you can participate in this. And they have a couple meetings coming up, April 9th and May 20th, and they try to alternate these between daytime and evening hours. And then one program that I think is really fantastic is MBTA travel training, and I'm actually gonna talk about that in more detail in my next slide. Um, but this is a fantastic program. It's for um, seniors and people with disabilities of any age, and you can get free travel training. Um, so I'll talk about that more, but I want to let you know, I have some flyers and we'll be publicizing this more, but we are going to be hosting an MBTA travel training session here on May 13th. It'll be from 9.30 to noon. It'll be really exciting. We'll be in a classroom just like this for a brief classroom overview, and then we'll actually go out into the parking lot. We'll have a regular sized MBTA bus coming into our parking lot. We'll get on that bus, learn about all the features, the accessibility features, how you pay, how you load money onto a Charlie card, um, talk about all of that, and then we'll ride down to Porter Square. You'll get familiar with how you would enter the subway and kind of the accessibility features there. Maybe take a little break in Porter Square, come back, board the bus, back to the community center. So if that's of interest to you or anyone else you know who's a senior or someone with a disability of any age, we encourage you to sign up. Um, and then reduced fares. So if you're a senior or someone with a disability, um, there are reduced fare programs. So there's the senior Charlie card, which you can get when you're age 65 and up. Um, you normally get those downtown at Downtown Crossing or um, through Senior Charlie Card events. We usually have at least one a year here at the Community Center, and our next one will be on May 15th. We encourage you to come. It's super popular. I think we usually process 150 or more Senior Charlie Cards each year when we do those. So, so come on down if you don't have one yet. Um, and if you're... Um, Caring, if you are someone with a disability who's not a senior, there's also the transportation access pass. They don't have, we can't do those events here, but um, you can get those through the MBTA. Susan, can I just ask a question? Yes. When you say you can get them in downtown Boston, you mean down in downtown crossing underneath near the subway? Is that where yes. it's still? So I'm just mentioning that because that's where I've taken my adult son with a disability. And 
it would be so much easier for you to come here or to go to a senior event. Down in a downtown crossing, it's hot, it's hard to get to, there are long lines, you, stand, you wait around for a very long time. So if you can get to this event, do your best to get there. Yeah. We, have, we usually have people waiting outside the door for us to open up when we host right. this one. Yes? I, is it, I have a sense that you have to renew it in Boston. No, you can renew it by phone. You, you don't can, have yes, to go in. But you, all right. There. Yeah, you don't. So don't come to this event if you just need to renew. Re, yeah. You renew by phone. This is if you just are getting it for the first time. Yes? You have to renew your senior citizens and discount card. It, it they last for eight years so look at yours um, it should have an expiration date on it so if it's expired you just renew it by phone I I oh yes I do I have it on a flyer that I made for the event um, that phone number is 617-222-3200 yeah, uh, yes, back here. Two, um, two questions. That's um, strictly for seniors. I, I the with senior Charlie card? Yeah, I, well, for the train. The oh, no, the training? training no, the training is for seniors or people with disabilities of any age. So if you're, even if you're working with youth, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk more about the training options. So even if you work with other people, I can show you some of those other options. But I think there was a question up here. No, it wasn't. I wanted to comment that you already passed by the ride and I no, I, I'm starting with the fixed route services first, and then I'm going to go on to the ride. Yes? I'm trying to renew mm -hmm. by phone. This is maybe one or two years ago, and it didn't work. Uh, so it's better to come here when they hold the session. Well, but the thing is, we can't renew them for you. The only thing we can do is issue new ones. We can't renew them. So I would call the number, and if you have any problems, I mean, I can connect with our, um, I would try again, and if you have any problems, you're welcome to take my car and I'll see if I can talk to someone about it, but we can't renew them. We can only issue the new ones. Oh, I meant that uh, when you held one of their sessions, uh, when the T came here and, and did a, a, a sign up, I was able to redo them. Um, I, to my knowledge, we have never been able to do renewals. We have only been able to do new Signups, and we all and we've been handing out a slip that says we can't renew. Here's where you call. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. We're gonna move on. So I did want to talk a little bit more about the travel training. <laughs> if the particular travel training that we're session that we're offering on May 15th doesn't work for you, know that there are other options. So there's an option where they just host regular classes at their own facility. And so you can schedule one of those. Um, they do small group trainings as well. So if you happen to work for a facility, a school, or somewhere, and you want to host your own travel training, you can organize that. You can do that. They also do, I think this is phenomenal, they do individual travel training. So let's say there's a place you need to go regularly, or maybe you're someone who's still working and you want to be able to get to work, but you're just not sure how to do that by the MBTA. They can actually come meet you at your home take you on that trip, ride with you, and ride back. And it's, and you know, one of the reasons they do this is there's just, you know, there's so many assets there that the MBTA has, they want to make sure that people can utilize them. And if you are able to, to utilize them, it gives you more freedom and it's also a lower cost. So um, I have some information there, but I also have these referral forms for the MBTA travel training if you want to take them with you. Okay, so also sticking with the whole bucket of fixed route services, um, locally in Lexington, we also have the Lexpress bus. So this service has been operating since 1979. And when I say it's you know fixed routes, these are the routes that we have. And the buses only travel on these routes. Um, Lexpress bus, if you're familiar and you know, you've taken with the MBTA bus, you know you stand at a bus stop sign. Lexpress is different you can get on or off anywhere along the route. And you just wave to signal you want to get on, the bus will pull over, let you on. To get off, you just pull the cord, or you just tell the driver, and he'll let you off. These are wheelchair accessible. They have a ramp, it, you know, with a lift, it um, holds 1,000 pounds, it exceeds the dimensions needed um, by the ADA requirements. 
Um, so if you have a scooter or if you're someone who uses a wheelchair, you can use the bus if it works for you. Um, we have room for two wheelchairs at a time in each bus. For seniors and people um, with a disability, during the day from 9 to 2, the bus is free. And you don't have to show anything. We kind of, it's kind of on the honor system. Um, and then it's 75 cents outside of that time. So the service right now is uh, Monday through Friday, 6.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. If you want to learn more about this system, we have an info session. We actually have two coming up. We have April 6th. It will be here in the community center from 11.30 to 12.30. It's free. We just ask you know, so that we have enough chairs. You let us know. And then again on um, May 18th from 10 to 11. That have, both of these are Saturdays. And the one in May, we're also going to host a special Saturday service of Express because we realize there's some people in the community that aren't usually here Monday through Friday. So this gives them a chance. It's actually part of the whole bike walk bus we sing. So um, we know that there's people that would like Saturday service on a regular basis. But at the moment, we do one or two a year at this point in time. And you can stop me if you have questions, but I also try to have some room at the end for this. So now we're moving on to the bucket of other. Um, so one of the biggest others is the ride. So if you are unable to use fixed route services, whether all the time you just can't use it or there's just occasions where um, mobility is impairing you from um, using fixed route services, there's the ride. So there are paratransit provider for the town and for many others. This is a door-to-door -door service. So if you need assistance getting to the door, they will do that. Those drivers will actually assist you to the door. They will even carry, if you, you have groceries, they can carry, you know, they're supposed to carry, you know, no more than 40 pounds, but their priority is you and making sure that you get to your door safely. Um, so eligibility is required. So again, there needs to be some kind of a mobility um, issue, whether it's physical, cognitive, mental. Um, you schedule an eligibility interview. So you call the number um, for the ride, say you're interested in determining if you're eligible, and then they will schedule um, a vehicle to come and pick you up. You can bring a caregiver with you if you want. Um, they'll take you to their office in Boston. They'll go through the eligibility interview. It may look different for different people, depending on what the needs are. And then they'll bring you back home. And there's no charge for this. And then you find out, you know, a few weeks later, um, whether or not you're eligible. Okay? And then if you need um, some emergency transportation, you know, prior to that, um, I believe they give you some kind of accommodation for that as well. Generally, the fares are between 315 to 525. It all depends on where you live in relation to a fixed route service, and that's per ADA requirements. Um, it is going up a bit. You may have heard um, MBTA fares are going up in certain categories, so those fares will switch to 335 and 560 as of July 1. But once you take the ride, um, once you're eligible, you can use this service from 5 a.m. to 1 a.m. So if you like to go out and party at night, um, <laughs> it's there for you. It's 365 days a year. Um, reservations are required, so you do need to call at least a day in advance to book that ride. Um, and right now, the uh, MBTA, they've been doing this Uber Lyft pilot. Um, have you heard about that? It's been, they keep extending it, and right now they say they're extending it through the end of July. Um, so we'll see what happens if they um, keep this as a permanent product or not. Um, but you have to tell them, so if this is something you're interested in, let's say you're already a ride eligible rider and you want to give this a whirl, you would have to contact the T and say you would like to have some of your rides be through this pilot. And they'll tell you how many you can get. They base it on how much you've so far been traveling. So if you haven't been using the ride at all, and now you're interested because you hear they have Uber Lyft, they're probably only going to give you two a month. But if you're someone who's been riding it, you know, like 40 times a month, they're probably going to give you a lot more because for them it's going to help reduce their costs. So, um, What's the difference between the Oh, so the difference between these is, so, so when you take the ride, they're going to send out whatever is the most appropriate vehicle for your need or what's the closest, you know, um, if you need a wheelchair accessible vehicle, obviously they're going to send out this wheel, one that's wheelchair accessible. The majority of ride customers, I believe it's about 80%, do 
don't actually need a wheelchair accessible vehicle. So depending on your need, they might send out just a car that says the ride. With Uber Lyft, basically you get a regular Uber or Lyft driver who's agreed to participate as part of this you know, program. And it works the same way, either you request these rides via the app or you can actually call, the MBTA has kind of like a concierge service through the ride where if you say you don't have the app, you can call and they'll send out a Lyft driver. Oh. And it reduces the cost to you. It's right now, it's, you pay the first $2 of the ride, the MBTA pays the next 40, and then um, you pay, if there's any additional, you pay the additional after that. So. Can I put on the Uber Lyft um, mm -hmm. option, would they also help carry groceries in and stuff like that and get you to the door, or is that just driving? That's a, that is just driving. Okay. Yeah, that is just driving. So, um, and that's a really good question. I think I wanted to check on, but I'm 99.9% .9 certain that this is definitely just truly okay. Uber Lyft. Okay. So that also means that this is more curb to curb the way Uber Lyft works. So it's really just using Uber Lyft, but there are some people that that's really what they need is they just need to get closer <laughs> to where they're going. Susan. Quick question. Yes, First of all, we have about five more minutes. Oh, uh, but, uh, but also, d is there help help installing the app on your phone and learning how to use it? Yes, there's a couple things for that. So, um, <laughs> one, you can come talk to us anytime you want. So we've done that. Sometimes people just come to the counter and we help them out. But we also have a group of teens that will help with technology. <laughs> um, and sure. so just check our program guide for that. But also, we really appreciate, um, there's a group in town called Lexington at Home. They um, are for seniors who are trying to age in place and they help each other, but they've been leading some workshops for us. Okay, so thank you. that's really great. And we have one of those coming up mm -hmm. as well. And I'll try to talk quickly. Uh, so that's the number for ride eligibility. And I can flash this later if you like. Can we make your PowerPoint available to people who left mm -hmm. us their email address? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, we have LexConnect. LexConnect is a taxi program. This was something the town started in, um, 2013. It is um, a taxi program. It's non-accessible, but if you know you're able to get in and out of a town car, this could work for your purposes. It's for people who are age 60 and up and are Lexington residents, or people under the age of 60 who have a disability. But again, keeping in mind that it's a non-accessible vehicle. Um, the hours are Monday through Friday, nine to five, or Saturday and Sunday, eight to eight. You do schedule these rides ahead of time. You um, schedule them through Check or Cab. You first have to fill out a very simple application. We just check to make sure you can get in and out of a town car on your own. And we also um, make sure you're a Lexington resident. And then you pay with vouchers. And the vouchers are going to cost you either, well, they all cost $5. You can have up to 12 vouchers a month. And rides within Lexington cost you one voucher each way, so $5 each way. These towns surrounding Lexington cost you $10 each way, um, so two vouchers each way. And then these um, more outlying towns cost you three vouchers each way, so $15 each way. Um, there's Fish of Lexington. I think this is a phenomenal program. It's been around since 1972. It's Lexington residents helping other Lexington residents. It's a volunteer driving program. So these are volunteers driving in their own cars and they are driving you to medical appointments only. So the car you get is the car that the driver has. When you call to book this appointment, they ask that you call two days in advance, but they'll ask you about your particular needs. So if there is a wheelchair, tell them, or if you have a walker, tell them, and they'll try to get the most appropriate volunteer and car for your particular need. And this can be, you know, it's kind of up to the volunteer and you what you work out. They might just kind of drop you there at the medical appointment. They might stay with you. So that can be worked out through that process. So, and if you're someone capable of driving, they are looking for volunteers. Yes? I volunteered for that and haven't heard a thing about it. <laughs> oh, they haven't gotten back in touch with you. Right. Well, I'll also take your information and pass it on. Mm -hmm. I'm really surprised because um, I know they're looking for more drivers. I also think it's a great way to build community. I've had some wonderful chats mm -hmm. driving, because uh, I drive for fish on my day off. I think it's great. Um, Uber and Lyft. So we have a workshop. If you want to know more about this, you can always talk to us. You know, in human services, we'll help you as much as we can. Um, these, the traditional way of using Uber and Lyft is you get an app. You can't make a phone call, right? You have to use an app, so you have to have a smartphone, and you load it 
your credit card information on here, and then anytime you take a ride, press a button, car comes to you, it'll tell you which car you're looking for, um, you ride, and then at the end, you can select if you want to give an extra tip or not, and that's it. There is an issue in that um, there's not a lot of accessible vehicles right now. Um, they do have something called WAVE, Wheelchair Accessible Vehicles, and the state is looking for Uber and Lyft to have more accessible vehicles, so hopefully that will be a, a promising change that we'll see in the future. Um, just not a whole lot right now. Um, and like I said, workshops we have on coming up, and I'm sorry I can't remember the date right now, but in our SAGE newsletter we have that, so if you catch me afterwards, I can give you the exact date. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions I can answer before we move on? Yes. I was just wondering how far um, Uber or any of the ones that you talked about go, the ride or... Well, the ride actually has a huge area. They have their map on their website. It's like 52 or 58 towns um, that it goes to. So it's pretty broad because the, they have to serve um, community... So the MBTA serves a wide area. So they have to have this paratransit service available within three-quarter miles of of their services oh, um, and for the Uber and Lyft they'll go anywhere I've heard people actually take them out of state oh, which is would be costly but right. you can do it I think I saw a hand oh back there okay do you have anything like go go grand grandparent where a third person oh thank you actually there were some others that I didn't mention um so yes go go grandparent so it's not like we offer it but go go grandparent is a you know third party operator so if you don't have a smartphone but you want to use Uber or Lyft they're kind of an intermediary, right? Where you sign up with GoGo -Go Grandparent, you have to give them your credit card information. They charge a little extra on top of the Uber Lyft ride, but they'll at least schedule the ride for you. Um, so you could just call, say, hey, I want an Uber. They'll schedule the ride. They take that a little extra onto that. And so you can use that. So you can just go right to their website and sign up for it. And there are some other services as well. So if you were needing more of like medical transport, I um, encourage you to get our senior resource guide. You can either get it online through the Human Services webpage, or we brought some copies as well. So if you need like me medical transport um, or some other services, they're in there. Yes. Could you have a companion like for the ride? If you mm -hmm. needed a companion, would they too be charged? Um, so if, if it's your companion, yeah. your companion wouldn't be charged. You know, if they're your personal care attendant. Yeah, personal but if you wanted to bring, let's say, you had a grandchild or you know, a family member that you wanted to ride with you, they could ride if there's enough room, but they would have to pay that rate that I showed you here, the 315 to 525. Yes? Yeah, the ride um, uh, went by kind of fast, and I missed the hours of availability. Oh, sure, 5 a.m. to 1 a.m. Yes, and you have to call 24 hours in advance. 5 a.m. to 1 mm -hmm. Oh, well, maybe it was a different one, but there was oh. one, it, it wasn't the ride then. It was the taxi? One. It had, uh, maybe. The vouchers? The, the taxi yeah, voucher Monday program? Monday through Friday and then had a week. Oh, sure. The um, taxi voucher program is Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Okay. And Saturday and Sunday, 8 to 8. Okay. Okay. You can call a taxi anytime you like, but for the taxi voucher program, that's when you can use those vouchers. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, if you're out drinking and you need a ride, what is that number to call? <laughs> if you're out drinking and you need a ride, okay. <laughs> well, the ride goes until 1 a.m., but um, but you mean like at that moment? If you need some, so that's one of the, the challenges with, with the ride and with, say, the taxi voucher program. If you need a ride right now, your best option, a friend maybe, um, but if that doesn't exist, then it's really like Uber, Lyft, or just a regular taxi. Um, anything else? Susan, I was okay, just going to ask the same question about a companion. Do you need to have documentation that it's your companion, or if you're an adult, you have an adult child with a disability and you're going with that child to a medical appointment? You mean via the ride? Yeah, or any, or the voucher or anything. I mean, you're just... Yeah, well, for the voucher program, it's actually been, if you're a husband and wife, we allow you to go. I, I mean, I think there can be it's some flexibility, yeah, okay. based on trip. With the ride, I would just ask that question specifically. I'm not sure. Um, that's a good thing for me to find out. Okay. Um, if, if you need a card, um, usually people get uh, like a personal care attendant card, so it would be interesting about the parents. I'll see if I can find out okay. for you. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.
Okay, and our next speaker, Gail, to put you on the spot, this is Gail Bartlett, and she is from the DDS, the Department of Developmental Services, Central Middlesex Area Service Coordinator Supervisor. Yes. And she's going to talk to you a little bit about using funds, mm -hmm. self-direction. So, okay, thank you. Welcome. I have to take off my coat. <laughs> and just set up a little bit. I'm, I don't have a very lovely PowerPoint, so you're just going to have me. <laughs> I'm hoping that I can be animated enough and interesting enough that, uh, that you won't fall asleep or miss the fact that there's no power. <laughs> well, thank you for letting me be able to share with you um, what I believe to be some really exciting um, support programs that the Department of Developmental Services has put together. Um, and what I really want to say is they put together because they have listened to the people that are serviced. And so that's how these came to be. So the Department of Developmental Services just briefly um, provides services to persons with um, developmental disabilities or intellectual disabilities or autism or somewhere on the spectrum. Uh, what I'm going to speak to are programs that um, work for, with adults ages 22 and over. Uh, so the first thing what a person has to do as an adult um, is to make sure that they are qualified for the, the Department of Developmental Services. And that's where a person will fill out an application um, and meet the eligibility requirements. If they're a little child and they're already in 688 or all the other programs, they don't need to qualify for this. But as an adult, if you're new to the service, you want to take and um, reach out to DDS and they will walk you through the whole entire program um, eligibility and assign you to an area such as where I am or um, let you know who to take a call. So the, the services that, that I would like to address today um, really evolved from um, the Real Lives Law, which is a um, law that went into effect in 2014 and came about from the hard work of people with developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities who were tired of the same old services. What they wanted were services that met their needs and that were more creative, more independent, and more autonomous um, instead of the regular old services. So they worked really hard, a, a group of folks, and presented to um, legislation and they had this real life loss that's passed. So kudos to them for actually saying, this is what we want, instead of having to listen to all the professionals and, and have to take only what was given to them. So as a result, um, we offer three different programs to support people with um, disabilities. The first one is our traditional program. And traditional programs <laughs> are um, where a person will be referred to an existing um, human service provider, and that human service provider will meet the needs of the person. Perhaps they need some residential setting, perhaps they need a um, day program or a work setting, or maybe they just need some supports in their home um, at night. So that's where your traditional uh, program, it still exists, and it, people are certainly um, able to use this, this program. The next program that evolved was called Agency with Choice. And we use acronyms, but Agency with Choice is basically a co-employment model, meaning a person who wants some services will be provided a list of folks, human service agencies, that participate in agency with choice. And, and they will, they're all, you know, they can meet with them, they can interview them, they can figure out where it is that 
this, the comfort level is. Once they, they become um, attached with one another, the services or the employment of staff and people to support you come from the agency. So the agency will hire people to meet the needs of the person, and though the staff are the responsibility of the agency. The individual or their family or, or um, you know, people that are supporting them will present to the staff what it is that they would like to have provided. Um, perhaps it's they want the person to come in three days a week for four hours. And the person will cook or clean or take them to medical appointments. So what they'll do is, you know, hopefully the staff works well with them. Hopefully the staff can meet the needs of theirs and can work the hours that they're asking for. So this is this co-employment model will exist for as long as you want to take and, and use it. The final um, program is called Person Developed um, uh, Program, or PDP. And that program is totally driven by the individual or family. There's no agency that you work with. You are the agency. So what you'll do is, along with your person or the, their, their family, will figure out what it is that they, their needs are, what they want to do with their needs, what kind of services they want, and then they will advertise for staff and hire the staff um, along with the support of a fiscal intermediary um, because DDS just can't hand people money. <laughs> we have to use a, an intermediary so the funds go to them and then they will take, help take care of paychecks and taxes and everything. So those are the three things right now, right, to give you a little overview of what they are. But where's this money coming from? And how do you know how much you have? And, and you know, how are you going to use it? So people have um, budgets. And when you first decide that you would like to go, traditional is not what you want. You want to go with agency with choice um, or person-directed programming. <coughs> You will sit down with um, your, your service coordinator, or me, or someone else who's um, fluent in the, the programming, and talk about what it is that you see um, your needs are. What are your goals? How, how do you really want to use this um, program? Would you like to have somebody come in and bring you to work and support you for a couple hours while you learn to work, bring you to the library, bring you shopping. Um, just be a companion that will stay in your house with you for a while. Or help you with your, your ADLs. Um, or bring you to a medical appointment. What is it that you would like to see <coughs> happen? Can you define ADLs for everyone? Sure. Um, ADLs are activities of daily living. Uh, sometimes they can be showering, dressing, um, cooking, um, toothbrushing, cleaning your house, um, just things that we do every day that they've got a name for them, but we just take and do them. So, uh, so with, with myself, and I'll just kind of use myself as an example, I will sit with folks and we kind of talk about that. What's your vision? What is it that you would like to take and see? And people will explain, they'll tell me, you know, and from that, from what the conversation is, I can get a sense of would an agency with choice be a better model for them, or would person-directed programming be better? Now, what's the difference? Agency with choice will hire your staff, will take and do all the work that an agency would do. They would supply the staff to you, and you can just direct them from there. Person directed, it's all on you. So you, meaning the individual and, and or their family, would find the staff, would develop a schedule, would 
set up the rate of pay. Everything that needs to get done needs to come from the agency that you've created. So sometimes that's a bit overwhelming for folks and they prefer to do the agency with choice. Either, either way, it's a, a way for self-direction because you steer the ship. You're the one that says, this is what I'd like to have. Um, this is what I'd like to have happen. Um, yes? Can a consumer choose a, a hybrid model of today's of agency yes. with choice? Okay. Um, I'm not sure if they can mix agency with choice or traditional. And, and tradition. Yes, they can do that. Yeah. Okay. Yes, they can do that. They can also mix um, if they Good have. Good morning. Would the owner of a blue Toyota Corolla license two JV1 please come to the front desk? Again, the owner of a blue Toyota Corolla license two three two JV1 please come to the front desk. Um, a person may um, live in a, a traditional model and use the PDP or the agency with choice for their day program services. Um, so you can mix it up like that. Whatever you're feeling like you would serve you best. I have a question about this. Is this agency, does the disability have to occur you know, at birth? Or let's say if you have acquired the disability later in life. Mm -hmm. Is D, DDF, uh, Department yep. of Disability, Developmental, Developmental disability. I mean, so I'm just sort of wondering, is this an, a, a congenital disability or an acquired disability? That, let's say if you're 45 years old and you right. acquire a disability, is, is this an agency that, that they could turn to? Basically what development, the department does is works with folks who acquired or had the disability from birth okay. or before age 22. May I ask a follow-up yes. question? Of course. So um, Carrie did a number of workshops mm -hmm. with older caregivers throughout mm -hmm. Massachusetts last mm -hmm. year and there were families that we met, the parents were probably in their 70s mm -hmm. or 80s and they had children in their 40s or 50s mm -hmm. and they've just been caring for them at home, doing it all and some of their kids who perhaps would be their adult children who perhaps would be on the autism spectrum now sort of their childhood predated mm -hmm. autism and okay. and diagnosis and and all of that so mm -hmm. in those certain situations mm -hmm. what's the application process the qualification process like um, ex exactly the same it's it's what what you do is you would reach out to the department we have a our regional um, headquarters in Danvers, and you would reach out to there. You could call a, an area office, and we could certainly direct you with the phone number, um, and fill out the application. And then someone from eligibility will come meet with you and go through the process. Now, um, DDS changed the eligibility criteria somewhat a few years ago. So it's not basically just measured with IQ, it's more measured with functionality. What are your, what are your needs that you're, you need support with? So it's not necessarily if you have a 75 IQ that you can't qualify, but it's more, of, it's more focused on the things that you need support with. If you have three or more um, areas that you need support with, that's where you, you can take it up. Yes, and we do have a lot of people that have never required any supports because mom and dad have taken care of their needs. Um, and sometimes mom and dad just aren't able to do it. So that's when we, you know, meet these people who are, you know, discover who they are. So, and we can sometimes help with the eligibility process as well. Okay, thank so, you. You're welcome. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I was hoping you could touch a little bit upon um, what DDS does for people with acquired brain injury. How is that a little bit different? That is a absolutely a new focus for DDS. Um, and I honestly don't know that much about it, but it is a growing department, and that is located also with um, in at Hogan Regional. Uh, and what they're trying to do is meet these people's needs 
Um, right now the focus is having people move into the community from nursing homes or from wherever they, hospitals or wherever they happen to be living and not need that you know, level of care because they can live in the community. But um, I honestly don't know that much. Um, I know that they started out with one home and now it's growing, growing, growing. And agencies are becoming very involved. Human service agencies are um, learning because the needs are quite different. Um, but they're um, <coughs> opening homes as well, so it's, it's quite exciting. But I'm sorry I can't help that much. So I think a DBS for people who have experienced cognitive decline as they, as they grow older. Mm -hmm. Could, can I speak Is to that? Is there anything at oh. DBS for people who have experienced cognitive decline? Well, actually, it's another service that we're learning about because we are experiencing people are aging in our system and we want to be able to support folks and we want to be able to support them in their home so that they don't have to leave. Um, and we are, what we'll do it in many um, instances is educate the staff and educate um, the folks that are living with them and then add additional staff as needed or um, have the person stay home as opposed to going out to a day program. So it's an area that is new, again, because people are aging, um, that we could use some more learning about, but we um, basically we just try to increase the staff. So that's for people who are already in the system. Mm -hmm. yes. um, or people that live at home as well. People that live in, in their own home. Already but they're already in the system. Yeah. I'm yes. trying to connect yes. the seniors Okay, gotcha. Program with what you're talking about. That's right. all. Okay. Yeah. Right. Wondering if and, I'm missing. Something. And and yeah. I would just say that we can work in collaboration. Just because someone is in the DDS system mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you know the service broker can reach out to, let's say, Minuteman or mm -hmm. um, the Council on Aging to try to support um, mm -hmm. around dementia right. or right. any you know cognitive issues like that. You can have. Um, both, as long as it's not under right. the waiver, you have to be careful with that. Mm -hmm. We can't have duplication, but we can right. add that, to that's it. That's the thing yeah. I was going to say is duplication. Yeah. We support many people who are still living in their own apartments um, with multiple services from multiple organizations. Um, whatever their needs are, Minuteman, is that where you're from? Mm -hmm. We have Minuteman services come in to support one, one man, and he has another agency, a human service agency, come in. And, provide some other support so um, and then I would say if the elder person is not in DDS but is having cognitive issues you could certainly come to Minuteman mm -hmm. Senior Services for support okay. sure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it is tricky because it's we've sort of been working I think for a long time sort of in our own kind of um, mm -hmm. areas and we're trying to branch out and sort of support each other mm -hmm. and learn about more specifics <coughs> about each other's work so that we're Try to utilize the resources for you know that exist in, in both areas mm -hmm. for that family or that individual. So we're we're having a learning curve too. <laughs> I've spoken a lot to Minutemen to ask what their services were yeah. and how we could apply them to different situations. Yeah. So does that help a little bit? It clarifies things. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um. All right. I'm trying to think of where I was. I was with <coughs> budgets. How long do I have? Um. About five minutes, I, five minutes, I, okay. I, I didn't pay attention when you started, but you have 15 to 20 minutes in all. <laughs> all right, um, all right. what I'm going to do then is, is um, people, people will discuss the goals and whatnot, and then the service coordinator will, will bring the situation back to admin, discuss the person, um, what their needs are, and then we can determine what a budget is, is the type of budget that we can assign. Um, and that's the money that people have to work with. You can work with that basically to hire your staff to figure out what it is that your staff is going to be paid, what their job um, description is, um, what they're going to take and do, their schedule. You can also pay for transportation. <clears throat> when I was listening to your thing, I thought, 
we pay for Uber for some folks. Um, <clears throat> with they, well, they, I should say we pay for people with um, the PD, within the PDP program utilize their funds to pay for the Uber program and the ride, um, and just make make things work for them. Um, you know, back in the day, you couldn't do that. You you know, traditional services wouldn't really allow that. So, it's it's made you know, person directed and agency with choice has allowed some creativity and allowed the pro the services to be more unique and um, individualized for what it is that you're wanting, um, as opposed to just taking what's there and, and then you're kind of out of luck. But um, the, um, I'm trying to think if there's any, does anybody have any questions? Because I could probably fill in some <laughs> questions as well. Yes. Can you address, um, you know, services that DDS provides for families who are older and they're still caring for their, mm -hmm. their loved ones who are now adults mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. worried about future when they're not there anymore? Can you right. talk, talk right. about what, how DDS can be helpful there? Um, well, one of the things um, that we can take and do is, is provide some supports in the home while the person still lives at home. Um, we can have um, arranged for a staff person to come into a person's home and take the person out a couple times a week, um, allowing mom and dad to have some you know, time without <coughs> having to care. We can ask that person to, well, it depends on the needs, that person can stay in the home and um, help out with some activities of daily living, maybe feeding a person if that's what the, one of the situations is, um, dressing them. Um, so there are, there are services that we could help with um, so that it makes life at home a little bit easier for the parents. Sometimes parents aren't able to lift anymore or move people around. Uh, and rather than they getting hurt, um, they perhaps could have qualified for a PCA for a person, a personal care attendant, um, which helps out. Um, they could possibly have a person that, um, you know, through PDP or agency with choice, come in and, and support them every morning from, you know, six to nine, if that's what is um, is needed so uh, so there are some there are programs that depends on the need carry on on what people it is that people really want uh, and sometimes we kind of have to pry it out of folks because they've done it their whole lives and it, it's very difficult to say oh well this is what we can do and you know you have to be sensitive to that as well is it income uh, dependent no no, basically what it is is just if you're eligible for DDS, you um, can be served. And it's yearly paperwork, yearly application? No, no. Okay. Eligibility is once you're in the system. You're no, in but the system. I mean oh. specifying the services that you want. Um, well, it, things may change over time. You may not like the way you, things worked out. Um, so you have that. Okay. You know, right to change it because you're driving the, the um, you know, the program. So if you don't want to pay for transportation anymore, as long as you have your eye on the budget, then you can figure out what it is that you want. You know, if you want to hire more staff, you want to hire staff at a lower rate, so that you know that you could give them a raise, which is always pretty nice. Um, that's a way you can use your funds too. Sure. Can you talk a little bit more about the budget? How do, how do you come up with that budget so people know what they've got to work? Um, well, the, bu the budget's, of course, based on what it is that DDS has in their funds. Um, but we have a, a collection of you know, funds that we, we try to make sure is, is in place. Um, basically, it, it's need-driven, and if a person has um, a higher need and would need more staff, you probably, it would be a little bit different. I work with families and ask, you know, we figure out all the, we figure out what the costs will be. 
and we kind of do different scenarios. If you want 20 hours of staff, you want to pay them $10 an hour, and you have a $20,000 budget, this is, what, this is what we can take and use. Or do you want to pay them $15 an hour, or do you want to pay $17 and get a higher quality people that may stay a little bit longer. Um, so basically it's determined on the person, um, and you know, $20,000 or $23,000 would be a, was a, a budget for one woman who had her daughter stay home with her and didn't want her daughter going anywhere else. She wanted her to be living at home with her, but she needed support because she couldn't, you know, move her about anymore. So that's how that was determined. But it's pretty individualized. Um, and I mean, there's not a formula we use. We just kind of focus on the needs and discuss that from there. What happens when uh, parents are no longer alive? Uh, if uh, they have been taking care of a, of a disabled child, have you had that experience? What do you do in a mm -hmm. situation like that? Um, we, one of the things we try to do is have a conversation before something happens, which may be a little bit difficult, but necessary. Um, and very often, parents have their plans of their own. Maybe siblings will be responsible or another family member. But if those people aren't in place, then DDS will find a place for them um, or put, being, put them in an apartment if that's what it is that they're um, able to do and want to do or match them up with um, a residence that has some vacancies and that matches um, the folks um, so that they would, you know, be certainly cared for, certainly cared for. Um, I'm just going to jump in. At the beginning, we talked about the, um, this being a, con a program in conjunction with the Ark of Massachusetts and the Dana Home Foundation. But the Ark of Massachusetts does have a program available called Support Brokers. There's a row of them back there. And one of the things that they do is facilitate those conversations in yeah. families and bring the families yeah. together. And, and, you know, there may be difficult conversations between parents and the other children, but when you've got a support broker there, there are ways to talk about passing the baton and how the baton will be passed that sort of, it, it, it's more comfortable. And Carrie over here in the green shirt yeah. is the director of that program. <laughs> and I've actually worked with Carrie, so, and we've worked with a, a, a gentleman and his family. So, I, I, I feel like I should have just talked about DDS, <laughs> because in the many services, and not just necessarily the, um, the, 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 three, the, th the three services that I, was, I mentioned, the traditional and the agency with choice and um, the PDP, because there's a, a lot more. Um, that we could have probably touched on, but do you have your cards with you? I do. I okay. Have many, many, many <laughs> cards, so I can certainly leave up, leave some here. Yeah, I'm not sure if you to direct this this question, but um, it seems to me that maybe a few years ago, five years ago, um, the town announced a program to have uh, people register that might need help in the event of some fairly overwhelming event, like a let's say a pandemic or a who knows, martial law these days, who knows? You know, <laughs> or, uh, or, you know, or a very heavy snowfall, like a couple years sure. ago. So, um, and, and so people, there was a list, I think, and then there were people who could volunteer to help out and <laughs> citizens. Do you know any Well, anybody? actually, no, that might sense. be a nice segue to our next speaker, but yep. thank you so much, well, Gail. I'll pass out some cards, or I'll leave them in the back, and please take them, and <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm going to jump on what you just said, sir. This is Melissa Interis. I don't know if you've ever met her, but she is the Director of Human Services for the Town of Lexington. So she's batting cleanup to just kind of tie together the three speakers that you heard up to this point. And so she'll be able to answer those questions. So thank you, Melissa. Yes, thank you. Um, to answer your question in the back, I wasn't here five years ago, so I'm not actually sure. I would have to look into that to see if that's something that's still in existence or if it was more around um, police and fire having information on folks who might need um, might need 
response immediately in the case of a weather event or something like that because we do maintain some of those lists but um, I don't know of one where there was like a sign up where you could volunteer to go help out a neighbor or something like that. I'm not aware of a structured program like that so I'd, I'd have to look into it. If you have any additional information maybe we can talk afterwards um, if you recall so I kind of know where to look for that. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about I think just kind of what's available through our department here. Um, we have a senior services division, we have transportation, who you heard from Susan um, on the wealth of options which still don't meet all the needs, but um, we're working on that. Um, we have veteran services and we have youth and family services. Um, so probably in terms of programming and services, our most robust division is senior services. Um, you, we um, publish a newsletter every other month on the next two months that are happening in terms of um, educational programs we have. Um, we have drop-in programs, discussion groups, we have weekly and um, sort of semi-monthly groups that meet more regularly, um, and lots of one-off things. So the sort of the focus in the next couple of months is around like health and patient advocacy. So we have um, a speaker and um, three different sessions of different topics we're going to talk about. Um, there are certainly programs that we offer as well through the Recreation Department, who's also housed out of here. Um, pretty, pretty fitness and um, sort of wellness oriented that they offer. But we have folks who participate, um, who have disabilities, who participate in some of those programs. Um, we have like you know seated um, fitness programs for folks who may not be able to um, to be able to be on their feet for periods of time, um, and you know some of those are very popular and, and able, fully accessible for folks um, who do have disabilities. So I think it's probably around disabilities in particular. It's um, it's individual conversations to sort of figure out how to where to best guide somebody based on what their circumstances are, what their interests are. Um, but know that we have a wide variety of things available to folks here, but we also have staff who can meet with you one-on-one -on -one to talk about specific situations, even if it's programs and services that you may need outside of this building. Um, how might we be able to help you find resources, direct you to places that would best meet those needs. So that's kind of really one of our focuses, is trying to connect folks with um, programs and services that will meet their individual needs. Um, let me see. Let, let me just check my notes. Um, by way of some of the conversations that were happening, I have a significant number of years of experience in um, managing Medicaid-funded programs. So um, I worked at a sister agency to Minuteman called Springwell, which is the we sort of the western suburbs of Boston for a number of years. Um, so there's a lot of programs, especially that provide in-home services to folks who have disabilities um, if you have mass health. And so a lot of the sort of ticket into some of those programs, if you're not DDS connected, um, are are around that mass health eligibility and if somebody has had a long-term disability and is um, you know receiving social security disability income or on a fixed income um, a lot of those folks qualify for mass health so if you're not aware of that um, you can definitely talk to me I don't necessarily assist with the mass health applications but I can at least assist with helping you understand what programs and services are available through MassHealth specifically, um, since I manage a number of those programs. Um, there, there's also managed care programs like the One Care program. I don't know if, if a lot of folks are aware of that, but um, it's, a, it's sort of a similar arrangement to what um, the state has with Minuteman in that managed care organizations will sort of have capitated funding to provide in-home services to folks who are between 18 and 64 with a disability. Um, and oftentimes, agencies like Minuteman are the ones who are actually coordinating those services. Um, so there's, there's a lot of other stuff out there that might be available to folks, if not DDS connected, um, that, might, that you may be able to take advantage of. Um, 
We also provide caregiver support groups here as well. <laughs> so um, we have a general caregiver support group for caregivers who are caring for someone with any sort of um, chronic condition or disability, as well as this one that's specific to Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, which is what I thought of when somebody asked about the sort of cognitive decline over the years, which may not then qualify them as, you know, a DDS recipient, but there's Minuteman, there's lots of other, other um, agencies that can help assist with those situations. Um, let me see what else. So Susan did talk about the Age Friendly Initiative. Um, we're kicking off a needs assessment with UMass Boston, and it's really aimed at gathering information about from residents um, about how we can improve upon um, Lexington in general. Um, and there's specific areas that we will ask about um, housing, transportation, isolation, um, communication. There's a few other areas that we will ask about. So. We will have a random sample of residents get a survey um, sometime next month that will ask some of those questions. We'll gather that information with UMass Boston, and um, Pat has the flyer back there. Um, we'll gather that information with UMass Boston, and we'll, together with them, um, look at what we may decide we want to focus on in the coming years, so kind of develop an action plan out of that needs assessment. There's a community forum that's happening on Monday related to that, age-friendly, that's here um, at the community center at 6 p.m. on this coming Monday night. And that's really just an informal, we want to hear what the strengths are in Lexington. We also want to hear what areas you see as needing improvement. So please feel free to come to that. You don't have to sign up. Um, it's helpful if you let us know you might, might want to come so we can kind of take a pulse of um, the number of folks who may be coming to that. Um, yeah? Yes. Um, Lexington, as you all know, is a very diverse community. But is all this information being shared to other people that may not be able to come out or understand or that they can utilize? <coughs> I mean, this rich community, we are <coughs> investing that. <coughs> Uh, are they being like, if I have a language problem, I'm not sure what you say, do they get the same information as we do here in this room? So we don't, um, we don't translate all of our information and send it out in all the variety of languages but for folks people, in Lexington. Are able to translate. But we do, yeah. We do have people who we can access for translation. Um, we can access interpreters ahead of time. If we know folks want to come in and meet with us, we can make sure we have either a phone or an in-person interpreter available. Um, so we can, make, we can definitely make those arrangements. We also have been looking to try to get more standardized interpreting hours here in the building. Um, we haven't been able to find somebody yet, but we're hoping that we could get just some like office hours for um, specifically for Mandarin um, speaking no, folks. No, I'm not just, just because I wrote Japanese, I'm more thinking about Oh, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that's a, that's a, I'm saying that's a need in Lexington with the senior population. Uh, yeah, so I wasn't making any assumptions. That's actually based on the demographics in town. We have a high Chinese American population, and by way of that, many of them speak Mandarin. Um, we know that's a need for our community. It's not specific to you at all. Just for your information, I do not speak Chinese. I'm just let you know. Uh, I, I understand when I was working Catholic charities, if you want translator, Catholic yep. charities. Yep. Any language you talk about, they have an interpreter for it. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's lots of other agencies as well, so yeah. Hi, hi. I want to talk about being able to get in and out of particular buildings versus, I'm, of course, on the Commission of Disabilities, <coughs> so I want, and I know you're aware of the... The Commission? Mm -hmm. Yep. And maybe you could talk about that a little bit. About accessing well, how buildings? I'm sorry. How would these people know where to go when they come in? I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what your a question is. problem with a building in Lexington. It's accessible. And accessible. So any building in Lexington or specific to the community center? No, not the community center. Any. Okay. 
Dr. Santos lawyers, I don't know. Yeah, so I, I know the commission is working on that. So the commission on disabilities in Lexington works with residents who have a who have identified a particular issue and they try to work with some of the service providers, the retailers, um, building owners in town to provide recommendations about accessibility. So if there is a building that's not accessible, a dentist's office for instance, um, the commission will assist with, with that collaboration between the two parties to make recommendations about what those those modifications should be. I don't know if that's sort of addressing. Yeah. Is the your commission's question. phone number on the Lexington Community Center website? It, I don't think it's on the Community Center website. They have their own um, page on the town okay. website. Okay. So it's the Commission on Disability, and they're a um, they're a town sponsored board or committee. Okay. So you. they have a charge and they have appointments of members and that sort of thing. Thank you. Yeah. Have you actually been able to get business owners to take uh, low cost, let's say, steps to make their uh, establishments wheelchair accessible? I think some have been receptive and have been responsive. I don't know what the success rate is because I don't sit on the commission. The building inspector. The building inspector. Sends, you know, first is a letter received and then um, the building inspector. So the person who looks at it you know, makes it happen. So the, she, Julie's saying that the building inspector works with the commission to work through some of those um, ADA, some of the ADA requirements and that sort of thing. I don't know enough about it to speak um, speak to it. I'm not on the commission. Um, what commission are we speaking on? The commission on disability in town. So they're oh, they're a town is entity. Is that the successor to the enablement commission? I don't is know. Still an I don't believe there's still. Is there an enablement? No, it used to be. It is. It is. It is. It the successor to the enablement? Yes. Yeah. Julie says yes. Got it. <laughs> I'm trying, I don't want to spread the word. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Thanks. It's helpful to have you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I find that very, very helpful. Yeah. Talking about the disabilities Absolutely. and everything. Um, if the town owns the house, the housing authority. <coughs> And the town, sorry to pick it on Lexington, but as good as Lexington is, it's not perfect. There are issues. Yeah, Great. Can absolutely. you tell Melissa your job and the yeah, capacity sorry. that you work? I'm a program manager. I work with, um, I actually live in, the, live in a house with adults with developmental disability, okay. functional disability. Okay. <clears throat> I don't want to say the name of the agency. I, say, I do not want to say the house. But if the town owns the house and the house and the town is not doing their job, then what do we do as a service provider? Mm -hmm. Because if it's directly related to um, the structure of the home, uh, having to do with handicap accessibility, mm -hmm. what do you do? So the town doesn't own the housing authority. Okay. I just want to be, be clear on that. The town does not own the housing authority. Okay. The housing authority board is connected to the town. And I'm, I, I'm sure there's some funding stuff that I'm not really on top of. Um, but they, the housing authority isn't a department, so to speak, of the town. The town doesn't own that entity. It's a sort of a separate entity. Um, but we work together. So I would say if there are... Um, <coughs> If there are ADA requirements that, or, or things, adjustments, adaptations that need to be made that aren't being made based on the needs of the people living in the home mm -hmm. um, as the homeowner or as the um, landlord, so to speak, um, has there been like official complaints filed or <coughs> any of that sort of stuff? Yeah. Well, be once. There, I think you could probably get the Commission on Disability involved. Um, at least as a, a resource and um, a, an assistance in terms of guiding you in the right direction for what the next okay. steps would be. Okay. I think that might be a good next step okay. to bring it to the commission. Um, I don't want to provide any specific advice. Sure, or, no, no, I find that very, I yeah, the, yeah. the woman in the front. Um, but I do know that there's also like the, um, I'm trying to think, of MCAD. Uh, mass commission against discrimination. against discrimination. There's some other things related to disabilities that are at the state level that could also potentially get involved if um, if there should be 
accommodations made that aren't being made. Um, so I think it depends on the specific yeah, no, situation. I don't want to say yeah, okay. I, I just also wanted to suggest um, the independent living centers <coughs> that are, uh, yes. you know, can go into communities and help monitor accessibility and that sort of thing. Yes. And I believe Lexington is covered through the uh, Boston, Boston Center. Boston Center. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. Yep. Yeah, who owned those houses? The housing authority owns um, the properties that they manage typically, although they do also have a partnership with LexHab to manage properties that LexHab owns. So it's kind of confusing, to be honest with you. I don't know, I can't adequately speak to those relationships and sort of how they come about, but I do know that the housing authority actually owns many of the properties that they manage. Yeah. But they are not Lexington. They're not. They're not sort of town owned, town run. There is a relationship there between us and the housing authority, but we don't directly oversee them from a town perspective. They're a separate entity. Federal funding and state funding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's had in the state. Yeah. And, and to fill the slots that are available. And so not necessarily less into people are going to get those slots. Yeah, so there's state and there's federal yeah. funding. And what else did you say, Pat, for the benefit of everybody else? It's, um, <laughs> the, the, I was going to say, there are different kinds of housing, public housing, or for, if you will, or assisted housing here in Lexington. And but Lexap is one of those where there is a lot of it. Yep. And if you apply for housing, there's, there's a lot of it. So somebody, if there's a, an opening that occurs here in Lexington, <coughs> it's not necessarily a Lexington <coughs> resident who's going to get that. Yep. So it could be somebody coming in from Arlington or someplace else. Yeah. There's any criteria, though? There are different, different criteria that I'm not aware of. Right. And it's similar with the housing authority, that they have a, they have a wait list. They, prioritize Lexington residents, they prioritize seniors, they prioritize people who may be technically homeless. Um, and it's a little bit, uh, it's hard to speak to exactly how they choose people off the list to then move in. Typically it's the first person on the list. But if somebody was in need of housing because they were homeless, they may go to the top of the list. So it's, um, it, it's not an area that we're in to be able to speak to that well. Um, but we're hoping actually to have a housing panel in the next couple of months at our Council on Aging Board meeting that will bring in some of those providers from the Housing Authority and LexHab to maybe be able to answer some of those questions and speak more eloquently <laughs> to it. Um, other questions? Pat, do you have a comment? Uh, just something that I, I kind of stumbled on. Um, I, was at the fire, I was at the fire department doing their temporary quarters, so I was taking a tour. And I found out about the Knox box. Yeah. And it's uh, the we don't have a grant now in Lexington, but I think the the fire department is going to be working on it. Yeah. The Knox box is a little box that fits either on the door or on the side of the, of the front door of your house. And you put you the fire department installs it, and it will have one of your your front door key in it. And I just purchased one, it's $177, which sounds like it might be a lot, but it's a lot less expensive than having to replace the front door and the door frame in case I have an emergency, need an ambulance, and they have no, no other way to get in my front door. Yeah. So oh, it's a sure. good thing to know about, you can pick up literature at the, the fire department. And also, um, it's not K-N-O-X. Yeah. Um, and only the fire department has access to the keys. Yeah, so. so that somebody, it's not like those little things that they put on the door if your house is for sale. Right, you know, right. right. So, yeah, there's, um, there's a master key that will open all of them that only the fire department holds of, the, of that particular variety. So only the fire department has the key to that box that you then put your keys into so they can enter the property. Um, my understanding was that the, when I brought this to their attention, but we, right now we, we have temporarily head of the fire department. Um, we, they, they're talking about there, were, there used to be a grant 
Yes. Um, and they're talking about maybe getting another grant in order to provide those. But I think it's excellent for anybody who is, uh, I mean, you know, I'm perfectly able-bodied right now, but God only knows if I get a heart attack, um, if I even get to the phone anyway. But, um, but at any rate, I think it's a good thing to know about it. I think it's a good thing to have. Mm -hmm. so Thank you, Pat. You, you have to pay $177 to have it again. And I think that they were talking about um, access, trying to access a Dana Home grant to maybe to pay for some that would be free for yeah. certain members if they met criteria, uh, for residents if they met financial criteria. I'm not sure what they decided might be. I think they had that they had program. A program at one time, yeah. But it expired. Yeah. Um, other questions? Yeah. I just wondered if you ever had a workshop on mental health disabilities. We've had some mental health focused workshops. We haven't, um, at least since I've been here, we haven't had one specific to di specific diagnoses. Um, so if there's something that you're interested in and want to provide some suggestions, um, we, we take those all the time. We're always sort of developing things based on what we've heard might be in demand at any given time. So we absolutely would, would um, would be interested if there was something more specific. We've had sort of general mental health and depression and isolation. Like but DMH. Yeah, but we haven't, I don't know that since I've been here, we've had anything like on schizophrenia or- Leslie, know, do you sort. offer anything of that sort? Uh, we have um, joined with, um, on the forum around suicide prevention that Lexington is doing. We're also on another couple of different communities. Um, we've started a coalition to address um, depression awareness and suicide prevention. So we do offer um, some evidence-based training on, it's for lay folks, uh, on, uh, it's called Question, Persuade, Refer, and it's an evidence-based training to really support uh, building awareness on um, mental health, specifically depression symptoms, but to really prevent suicide. Um, so we've kind of taken some yeah, of and those we have types a, of activities. We have a staff person who's also <laughs> trained to be a trainer in that as well. Um, that's one of the things we'll be doing more of in the coming years, but that's really pretty specific to suicide prevention. Um, yeah, Carrie. So I just wanted to also suggest um, connecting with NAMI. That's yep. the National Alliance yep. for, mental, yep. for Mental Illness. Yep. And they're a you know, family they're caregiver type of advocacy group yeah. that yeah. probably give some great information. Yeah, we get um, resources from them uh, pretty regularly. We haven't co we haven't collaborated with them yeah. on anything, but I think that's one of our goals. Pat? That's another one of the issues to bring up on Monday at 6 o'clock. You're at the community <laughs> center and they'll be talking about age-friendly Lexington. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Pat. Age-friendly what? Uh, age-friendly. Um, so a Lexington for all ages is kind of how we've positioned that. Um, and we already had one for them yeah. last week, and we have one coming up on Monday night. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I have a part of the